G'day everybody, welcome to BitShares.TV, I'm your host Max Wright and today I want to talk a little bit about the philosophy of cryptocurrencies and the, the, the idea of freedom and voluntary interaction in a non-violent way. And the, the origins of this really do go all the way back to the very beginnings of cryptocurrency. Certainly in Satoshi Nakamoto's writings you can see that he's very much of that same philosophy. And by my estimation anyway, there were kind of three main groups that kicked off that were the initial users of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. And the first kind I would say would be technologists. Those are the guys who are just fascinated by the technology of, the, of, the, of it all. Um, and just wanted to play around and tinker because that's the way that their mind worked. The second group, group I guess, um, was probably the, uh, let's say, the, the, the crew from Silk Road. Um, they were the ones who were, they were locked out of the traditional finance industries and uh, payment sectors because of legalities. And so they were forced to find a decentralized mechanism to transfer payments. And I would say the third group was those that were ideologically driven. The ones that I would say would, would be, you would uh, probably label as libertarian. Um, again, that same philosophy of uh, non-violent interaction, contract only, and these kinds of things. So we're going to talk a little bit today now with Dan Larimer, who is the uh, original visionary of BitShares. He, uh, he was in fact on, in those forums chatting with Satoshi back in the day, hashing out the ideas of cryptocurrency. So Dan, welcome. Thank you for having me. Why don't we get started? Why don't you uh, share for us, uh, I guess, the, what, what your idea of, of the philosophy of freedom is and the philosophy that you've kind of brought to BitShares in that way. The philosophy of freedom for me is all about the uh, principle of don't do it unto other people what you don't want other people doing to you. That's the uh, non-aggression principle. But if you apply that consistently, uh, you, you can derive my entire worldview and philosophy. And I use technology as a means of reaching the ends, of uh, as a means of reaching that freedom, that ideal, of implementing the philosophy in society. Uh, you have a lot of places online when people, libertarians will rant, the government's doing this, the government's doing that, let's petition them, let's ask them, let's beg them. Uh, some people say, well, we should fight violently and overthrow them. But I'm very much of the mindset that the, the free market needs to be able to provide security, uh, needs to be able to protect our life, liberty, and property against all aggressors. That means that the free market needs to produce solutions that uh, can protect us against today's governments without requiring today's governments to disappear first. The, the solutions need to be so powerful and so effective that they work today even in the middle of uh, what many people would consider uh, big brother government, uh, 1984 level surveillance society. Yeah, so let's maybe talk a little bit about where this technology is going. Uh, we're about we're coming up to six years into uh, Bitcoin. We've got some uh, like unbelievably exciting things going on with BitShares coming out over the next few months. That's really going to give a really uh, an incredible toolkit for uh, the rest of the world to use. Bitcoin applies to currency. We've got BitShares that can apply to many different areas of of contract and business and so forth. What are the other areas, or let's go forward a few years and let's think about where this technology can actually take us. Where the internet and blockchain technology can take us is a society where every transaction you do is settled on a blockchain, where every dispute that you have is resolved on the blockchain, where your reputation and your identity are managed on a blockchain, where your voting happens on a blockchain, and where all laws that you agree to follow, you've signed to, and posted on a blockchain. Whenever you go to do business with someone, you bump your phones together, and it verifies that you've got compatible arbitration agreements automatically. And when you make that purchase, you've got a signed record, a signed receipt uh, of what it is you are buying and uh, what terms you agree to. So you've got these verifiable, provable signatures. You've got built-in arbitration. You're only held accountable to your own laws. Every member of society can be bonded with, by, have, by posting a bond on the blockchain in security against your compliance with the laws that you have agreed to follow. And all this stuff can be done in an entirely voluntary manner that does not depend upon initiating force or violence against anyone. It can be done in an entirely legal way because it only depends upon free speech and voluntary association. So I, 
can envision that blockchain technology will allow us to create a world where the forces and incentives for being part of the BitShares community, of the uh, blockchain crypto community, uh, the efficiencies you gain are so strong that your profits are so much higher that being rejected or shunned by that community uh, forces you to deal with people outside it. People who have to charge higher fees, require security deposits uh, for your utilities, for your rent, for everything under the sun. Uh, because the cost of doing transactions, the cost of doing business outside the system will be higher than the cost inside the system. So I can see this creating a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle where the more people that join and participate and start doing commerce entirely on a blockchain, merchants and consumers, never having to leave back to the fiat world, uh, they'll start to see uh, a growing snowball of uh, effect until it gets to a point where no one dares be a government official because they'll be excluded because they're participating in the initiation of violence against others. So these things are possible. Um, I would say that the thing that differentiates me from a lot of other people is that I don't give up on finding a solution. I believe a solution exists. I don't believe that violence is a necessary response to violence. Uh, that you must create governments in order to have law and order. I believe that good people don't have to resort to bad things just because bad people exist. And uh, I'm not going to rest until we figure out and solve those problems. But if you have the faith and you're willing to uh, not give up until you've found a solution, then you will find the solution. Uh, you know, people didn't give up on flying until they figured out how to fly, and now we fly all the time. Uh, but before you, people flew, they said, that's impossible. Well, today people say it's impossible to live in a world without a government backed by violence. And I say, don't give up. Uh, instead, join us and help us innovate the solutions and adopt them. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is, whether you're worried about pollution or child abuse or roads and highways, all these things that people like to thought, well, you need government for this, that, the other thing. Don't give up. We can find the solution. Let's work together. That was something that really caught me by Bitcoin. It's why I became such a Bitcoin fanatic uh, when, you know, when I first learned about it back in 2012. For me, I'd been a libertarian for over 15 years and uh, understood the you know, philosophy and arguments very well. And I found that the, the apathy of people uh, to, to pursue their own freedom, well, I, I found it mind-blowing. And uh, with, unfortunately, it was a very small percentage of the people that are interested in the message of liberty and their freedom and how can the world be a more peaceful place. Uh, but when I discovered Bitcoin, what I found was I could give them the tools to actually create freedom for both themselves and myself without having to go into the philosophy of freedom and libertarianism and all those kinds of things. And so I, I realized very quickly that promoting Bitcoin, promoting blockchain technology became, was a very, very good tool where the, the person was self-aligned in the case of Bitcoin, uh, just through making money from the uh, price increase of Bitcoin, people could actually save themselves whether they knew they were saving themselves or not. And uh, that's been the, my experience throughout the entire blockchain journey in my education over the last few years. And uh, that's why I've dedicated so much time toward it. Let's talk a little bit about now. I, I, I see something happening in the world which I find very, very reassuring and very, very exciting. Um, back in the day, I feel like you know the government would you know like shut something down. Maybe let's talk about like Liberty Reserve or eGold. And someone said, you know what, this this money that the government is forcing me to use, I don't think it's a very good money. I think the money can, the government is inflating it. I think they're devaluing it, and I don't think it's a good money for me to use. I'm going to go ahead and start something like an e-gold or a Liberty Reserve, which is a gold-backed currency. And we saw, you know, you know the government sends out uh, you know, police, FBI, whoever it is they send, men with guns, essentially, and say, and under the guise of anti-money anti laundering laws and things like that, they shut down any competition to currency. And, you know, it takes a long time for the community to, to recover from that and to think, well, you know, how this is going to take place. I feel like now the technology is moving so fast that the politicians don't even, they're, they're trying to you know, restrict Bitcoin, make laws against it, uh, and all these all cryptocurrencies hinder its growth. 
And I feel like not only is the community um, sort of anticipating it and coming up with tools to defeat the, you know, the attacks against it in real time, they're even coming up with the tools to defeat future attacks in anticipation of those attacks. Are you kind of saying the same thing? And what do you think that trend will have for us? It's just market forces. The market says there's supply and demand. The demand for freedom technology is so high that the market is providing. And that's what's going on. The politicians, they don't even understand Bitcoin because the market is innovating faster than the politicians can understand what, their thre what the threat is. Uh, and you're right. They, uh, because they don't know what Bitcoin is, they don't have an easy way to stop it. It's kind of like uh, file sharing. That's been going on for 20 years and they haven't been able to stop that yet. And every time they shut down Napster, a new system pops up that's even more decentralized. So it's like the tighter they grip, the more freedom we end up getting because we create things that are beyond their ability to control without shutting down the internet itself. And fortunately for us, the internet has become such a vital component of everyday life that if you put the restrictions you'd have to put on the internet in order to stop this type of technology, you would, uh, I mean, this is being used in China, and China is very repressive on their internet. So you'd have to uh, really piss off the general public and uh, the social unrest that would result uh, out of an attempt to stomp out these technologies would be immense. Yeah, I get, I, there's a quote from Gandhi which says, um, the job of uh, the civil disobedient is to bring the violence out into the world for everybody to see so that the world can realize what's going on and fight against it. And, you know, one of his, uh, one of the highlights, I guess, of, of his journey was uh, he just, you know, lined up hundreds of thousands of uh, Indians, single file, to uh, attack, attack non-violently the salt mines protected by the British government. And they just came up one at a time, took a beating, <laughs> walked away one at a time, took a beating, and the violence became so apparent to the rest of the world that, that the, you know, the feedback and the, the horror just left the British empires like they would look like such the bad guys that they just had to go away and stop using violence as that solution. And I think that's a really good lesson. I think that's kind of where, where Bitcoin and BitShares and the entire cryptocurrency movement is moving people towards. It's like, okay, government, if you want to shut down the internet or, you know, you're going to have to really let the people know what's going on. You're going to have to, in order to do this, you're going to piss off everybody so much. You're going to demonstrate to everybody exactly the tyranny that they're living under, that they're kind of missing, that many people are missing at the moment. You're going to have to let them know. And that is kind of the job of the, the civil disobedient, uh, according to Gandhi, which I kind of agree with. You mentioned another thing in there, which is very close to a, a quote that I almost use every single day when looking at cryptocurrencies. Um, it's a quote by Princess Leia from Star Wars, but it's, the more you tighten your grip, Tarkin, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. And that's very much the way I feel uh, Bitcoin is. I feel like there are so many minds now, thanks to the internet, I think so significantly, there's such, uh, so many minds out there working towards peaceful, non-violent solutions, uh, creating systems that are violence resistant. And I think that's one of the key words that I think about when I think about blockchain technology. It is resistant to all forms of violence. And the more people out there with this philosophy, the more developers and entrepreneurs out there creating solutions that are resistant to violence, I think the end destination is by default uh, a very peaceful and non-violent world. When, when you adopt a non-violent strategy, and when you promote nonviolence, peacefulness, and say the only thing I'm asking for is freedom of speech, the ability to sign cryptographic messages and broadcast them to the world. That's the only thing I'm asking. I'm not asking for you to enforce any laws, to do any favors. I'm not asking for anything from anyone. Uh, and I'm getting attacked, thrown in prison, uh, abused for um, exercising my freedom of speech. It's very difficult for um, governments to maintain that. And it kind of shows, you know, night and day, you have the contrast. If you don't have the contrast, then it's hard to get sympathy, right? You don't know who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. And that's the problem with the Occupy movement. That's the problem with protests. They all are violent. Out, you know, they're asking the government to use violence. They're asking the government to change. They're trying to pressure the government with violence, destruction of private property, uh, all these things, they don't get the sympathy and they end up, because they're of the same concept, 
violence. They're founded in violence. They end up creating and promoting violence and escalating violence. Whereas with blockchain technology, we only have to ask one thing. Let us be. We're not harming you. We're not going to harm anyone else. All we're doing is trading information. And uh, the fact that that information produces wealth and gives us influence in the economy, that's the side effect of free freedom. I totally agree. And just going back to uh, the previous point, we talked about, uh, you talked about how what it would take for the government to shut down blockchain technology that effectively have to shut down the internet and you know the, the, the horror that that would cause. Um, in addition to that, there are already people and large numbers of people creating the infrastructure to replace the internet if that was to ever happen. Mesh networks is um, gaining incredibly, incredible popularity. And just recently we saw some protests in Hong Kong uh, and you know, government up to its old, their old tricks, they shut down the internet service so the protesters could not coordinate. The Chinese government wanted to, uh, let's say, choose a slate of uh, their selected nominees that the Hong Kong citizens could vote on. The Hong Kong citizens said, "This is uh, we're not down with this, we want to choose our own, delega our, our own uh, candidates, I should say. And uh, the government, they went, they went out to protest, the government tried to shut them down, and then through a software program, I think it was called Open Garden, um, the, which is a mesh network communication tool, the uh, Hong Kong protesters were able to con continue communication. And we see that these, again, this goes back to the point that the freedom movement is just getting so far ahead of the violence movement that they're anticipating where they're going to get attacked at next and building the tools to make those attacks absolutely useless. Do you have any final comments, Dan, before we head off? Yeah, I'd like to say that the key thing, uh, also back to just the whole philosophy, is that if you want to have sustainable growth of freedom, you have to make freedom profitable. If you, if you can't make money at it, if you're asking people to donate or give of themselves or sacrifice their time, uh, you're not going to have a sustainable movement. So that's why everything we're doing with BitShares is focusing very much on making it in the financial interest of all parties to participate in the system uh, rather than rely on donations in order to grow. And I think that the realization that blockchain technology for the first time gives the freedom movement a currency, a means of reimbursing and recognizing the labors of others uh, means that we don't have to do this voluntarily. And that's going to grow much faster because whether you agree with the philosophy of nonviolence and freedom or not, you respond to profit motive. If it's more profitable to be nonviolent, you're going to be nonviolent. It's that easy. And so that is the real innovation, is aligning the financial incentives of all parties so that we're all pushing in the same direction rather than competing and fighting. I totally agree, and uh, it's a great point to end on. Like I said earlier, it's like the, the gift for me for, for Bitcoin and the beginning of cryptocurrencies was that I, all I could do was you know, sell people what they wanted, tell people about this incredible financial tool that was going to help them out, and they were achieving their own freedom. BitShares is another tool I have in the arsenal to use in that exact same way. The difficulty of you know, trying to create people, convert people to libertarianism, that whole challenge is just ignored now. Now you just give them something that's going to make their life so much better. And it's going to give them freedom and me freedom as well. Hence, I spend so much time doing this. Dan, thank you so much for joining us for another episode. Uh, guys, if you enjoyed this episode, please go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And uh, somewhere on this page, if you're watching it at bitshares.tv, there will probably be a place for you to enter in your email. I can let you know of any future updates, the future videos that we make. And uh, go ahead if you do those things now. Dan, thank you very much. We'll see you guys later.